Good evening. My name is Virginia Sapiro. I am the Dean of the College and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And I am delighted you've come here. It's a beautiful spring evening, gorgeous weather out there. So I thank you very much for being here. The Discovery Series is a part of our ongoing effort to extend the learning community that is Boston University to alumni and to help you to continue your education at BU wherever you are and whatever your life stage. We are trying more and more to recognize that once our students are here and go out into the world from whatever college you went to, that we want to continue to be a part of your life and especially to continue to be a part of that lifelong education that I know we all care about. The next Discoveries program will be on May 14th. The title of that program will be The Road to Slugal, Gesture-Based Computer Search Tools for American Sign Language with CAS faculty from the Departments of Computer Science and Linguistics. I can say briefly that it is going to be fascinating. We have faculty from computer science and linguistics working together to develop a dictionary of sign language, uh, an online dictionary, and it's really the first time that this is happening. So it's an amazing collaboration and an amazing bringing together of ideas about language, ideas about computer science, and I think you'll find it very fascinating. At the same time, I also want to say we're beginning to shape up next year's program. We have some great candidates for lectures and discussions next year, so I hope you'll watch for what we're doing after this academic year. We also have some other events recently that are part of our efforts to continue being part of the continuing education of our alumni. We had our first alumni webinar recently called Future Trends in Climate, Development, and Security with Professor Adil Najam, who was a co-recipient along with other scientists of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize along with Al Gore. And this was a very, very interesting session. We're planning on having a number of other webinars over time. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the financial crisis and economic recovery. This period, of course, has affected all of us in direct and indirect ways. I'm very pleased to say that although Boston University faces great challenges that stem from this worldwide crisis, we are actually in very healthy shape here. We, like other universities, have to strive for greater efficiencies, and we have to reduce some of our expenses to get through this period and move safely into the future. But unlike many universities, our model of getting through this crisis includes continuing positive measures to strengthen our undergraduate and graduate education and research programs. For example, by moving forward in our strategic plan to hire new faculty who will serve our students and help this institution continue to make major contributions to knowledge. As an example of what we're doing, I'm pleased to say that the College of Arts and Sciences alone has already hired more than 25 new faculty during the course of this year in fields from chemistry to history to religion to political science and economics. So when people talk about uh, their work during a crisis making them stronger, in this case, it truly is happening. So much of what we do here at BU is made possible by the generous alumni, parents, and friends that support our annual fund that I'd really like to encourage everybody to participate and hope you'll encourage your friends as well. BU has launched its first ever $1 million annual fund challenge where every new dollar and every increased gift from now until June 30th will be matched dollar for dollar by trustee Sid Feldenstein. What this means is that gifts at any level of support for the annual fund, if you haven't given before and give now until June 30th, that gift will be matched dollar for dollar. If you've given before, if you gave last year, we thank you, we hope you'll renew, but if you increase that gift, your increased generosity will again be matched dollar for dollar by Mr. Feldenstein. So we wanted to let you know about this. Outside, we'll have uh, cards that you can use. The, this generous help allows us to do things like support our students through scholarship, 
continue to be able to attract and retain and nurture the careers of our best faculty possible and to support the education of our graduate students and undergraduate students. I thank you all for participating tonight and I thank all of you who have assisted us in this way. Let me then turn to our panel for tonight and the topic. I want to uh, take just a couple of minutes to tell you about our panelists and then disappear and let them uh, start talking. What we've decided to do, we have a panel here of very distinguished members of the Boston University faculty, uh, visitors and, and uh, long-term faculty from a number of colleges. I'll introduce them and then each will take five minutes, no more to share with you their thoughts about the financial crisis and recovery this year. When they're finished, we'll have general discussion uh, and hope you'll ask your questions. As Roger said, there will be microphones so you can ask questions and make comments. And then at the very end, what we're going to do is save a few minutes for a lightning round where I've invited all of our panel members after having listened to your questions, participated in the discussion, each to take one minute to give you their final conclusions that they draw from everything we've talked about. Then at the end, I invite you outside for a reception. So let me introduce our panelists. Robert Bench, Bob Bench is a senior fellow in the Marin Center for Banking and Financial Law. He has been involved in financial regulation and supervision for 43 years. He served with the U.S. Treasury's Office of the Comptroller of Currency for 22 years as a national bank supervisor and with PricewaterhouseCooper for 16 years as managing partner of its regulatory advisory services practice. In so-called retirement, Mr. Bench has served as an advisor to the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation and he's chairman of the steering committee of the Financial Services Forum in Toronto and he's a member of the Governing Council of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation in London. Next along the line, Simon Gilchrist is a professor in the Department of Economics. He is also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Prior to his arrival at BU in 1995, Simon Gilchrist served as a staff economist at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and has held visiting positions at, the, at MIT and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. He served as an academic consultant to many different public institutions, and he is a well-known scholar in his field. Moving along to Larry Kotlikoff, he is a professor of economics. He's a former senior economist with the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and works on a wide range of topics in economics, including public finance, macroeconomics, economic growth, health economics, corporate finance, and personal finance. Many of you may know his book, The Coming Generational Storm, What You Need to Know About America's Economic Future. He's a frequent contributor to the National Economic Policy Debate and his website, he wants you to know, contains a long list of columns written for the public about the current crisis and how to fix it. Next along the line, Charles Whitehead joined the Boston University Law Faculty in 2006 from Columbia Law School, where he was a research fellow. Before entering academia, Professor Whitehead worked on corporate financial capital markets and mergers and acquisitions transitions, transactions in the New York, London, and Tokyo offices of a major New York law firm. He's also held senior legal and business positions in New York and Tokyo for two global financial service firms. Professor Whitehead was a law clerk to the Honorable Ellsworth Grafiland, U.S. Court of Appeals, Second Circuit. He's a member of the American Law Institute. William Grimes is associate professor in the Department of International Relations at Boston University, and he is the founding director of the Boston University Center for the Study of Asia. He is the author of Unmaking the Japanese Miracle, Macroeconomic Politics, 1985 to 2000, which analyzed the politics of macroeconomic policy during the years of the Japanese bubble and the lost decade, and he is the author of Currency and Contest in East Asia, The Great Power Politics of Financial Regionalism. 
this is the first book-length study of East Asian financial regionalism in English, among many other books that, and articles he's produced. He's spent nearly eight years in Japan, including several stints as a researcher at the Japanese Ministry of Finance, Bank of Japan, and the University of Tokyo. Graham Wilson is a professor of political science. His research examines public policies comparatively, focusing on advanced democracies and ranging across diverse policy areas that include agriculture, occupational safety, and the environment. He is particularly interested in the relationship between business and government, and he has published extensively on interest groups in the United States and advanced democracies generally. He is co-editor and contributor to the forthcoming Oxford University Press book, Business and Government, and he's the author of Business and Politics, a Comparative Introduction. So um, I'd like you to help me welcome these people, all of them scholars, practitioners, knowledgeable people who will share with you their ideas. All right, thank you, Dean Sapiro. I've got to get going in my five minutes here. Uh, but it's a pleasure to participate. Uh, thank you to Roger Rooser and Lauren Hall for their arrangements and in, in, uh, helping me get here. Uh, congratulations to CAS for putting on the program. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion on this crisis on the banks of the Hudson and the banks of the Potomac. And I think it's good that this, we start to have discussion of this crisis on the banks of the Charles. Um, we want to remember, or I think the crisis helps us remember, that the financial system at the end of the day is a utility function. It's a social utility function that serves, is fundamental to our uh, ex existence in our modern world. But the financial system inherently is fragile. It's fragile because it's an intermediary system. It's exposed to external risks, war, weather. Uh, it's exposed to internal risks, stupidity, poor risk management. And this crisis has basically come about because of internal mismanagement uh, of financial institutions, but th 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 the mismanagement is so great that there's contagion out into the real economy, so we have a ricochet process going on of poor management of financial institutions, leading to poor economic events, feeding back into the financial institutions, whacking them again, and we've got ourselves in sort of a negative feedback loop between the real economy and financial institutions. I personally think that financially as well as psychologically, the center of the crisis still is all about real estate financing, but other significant trouble areas have come about or have morphed because of the, um, the problems, and that's in the commercial industrial loans, commercial real estate loans, credit card loans, and certainly the debts of municipalities and increasingly the debts of nations. Uh, collectively, the flaws in finance have caused the financial system to become dysfunctional. It's no longer a useful utility on its own. Consequently, there's been a loss of trust and confidence in financial institutions, the people who run them, and their products. There's been a contraction of credit and investment, leading to a collapse of demand. Because of that, we've got these negative feedback loops between the financial sector and the real economy, as well as negative growth and increasing unemployment. The crisis is global. National and multilateral solutions are required. The solutions need to address three dimensions the financial economic dimension, the social political dimension, and the geopolitical dimension. Solutions need to stop the collapse of demand, return confidence to stimulate credit and investment, and restore growth. And so we witnessed staggering amounts of taxpayer assistance as governments intervene directly into banking, credit, and capital markets. As they intervene, governments understand traditional arrangements for doing so are inadequate. There is now a common imperative to devise new arrangements for today's realities. So nationally, we see unprecedented initiatives by the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the U.S. Treasury. Internationally, we see the G20 Steering Committee, the group of 20 countries steering this, or trying to manage this crisis, as well as we see the elevation of China and other countries 
into international economic policy making. Safe to say that laissez-faire is finished, Reaganism, Thatcherism is over. We indeed experience a new era of high public sector activism in the financial sector and in the real economy, nationally and globally. But in that process, watch out for higher levels of populism, nationalism, and protectionism. Watch out for reverse globalization, especially in finance, as finance becomes more localized and regionalized. And with all this change about to come, let remember, capital goes where it is welcome and stays where it is well treated. Thank you. Um, so the current financial crisis is clearly a result of the collapse in housing prices that led to large losses on asset-backed securities held by banks and other financial institutions. It was fueled by cheap money from abroad, the so-called savings glut, and by lax lending and underwriting standards. And it was amplified by the extreme risk-taking of the financial sector, a consequence of compensation schemes that reward short-term profits at the expense of longer-term returns. The crisis has led to the worst recession in the U.S. since the Great Depression. Consumption investment spending have collapsed. The unemployment rate has risen from 4.5 percent to 8.5 percent. The policy response includes bank bailouts, exp expansionary monetary policy, and the massive fiscal stimulus. Despite all this, a reasonable forecast for unemployment is that it will rise another two percentage points to 10.5 percent in the coming year. The main problem today is the health of the financial sector, which includes banks, investment banks, and insurance companies. The banking sector is arguably insolvent, and we can expect more losses to come as housing prices continue to fall and mortgage default rates rise. The next shoe to drop will be the collapse in values of assets backed by commercial real estate loans. These assets are held by small, uh, small to medium-sized banks, and these banks are responsible for the bulk of lending to small businesses and households. With short-term nominal interest rates at zero, the Federal Reserve has been forced to adopt unconventional policies. It's now a direct lender to major U.S. corporations via the commercial paper market. It's also purchasing large quantities of assets, asset-backed securities held by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and it has plans to intervene in the market for credit card debt, auto loans, and other securitized lending facilities. The goal of these policies is to reduce borrowing rates directly given that the current nominal interest rate is zero. The Geithner plan is again focused on purchasing bad assets from banks. The plan allows private invest investors to purchase these assets using leverage ratios of seven to one while exposing such investors to virtually no downside risk in the process. Because taxpayers bear virtually all the downside risk, this plan works by artificially bidding up the price of bad assets. As such, it should be understood as a taxpayer giveaway to the banking sector. Despite the generosity of terms, it's unclear that this will work, at least without forcing banks to sell the assets using the so-called stress tests as a stick and a carrot. The alternative is taking over banks. Unfortunately, banks are like potato chips. It's hard to just take over one. <laughs> Looking forward, the Federal Reserve is in the unprecedented position of holding $2 trillion of assets. This number could easily rise to $4 trillion by the time we're done. The Fed will need to find a strategy to unwind these positions in a timely manner without fueling inflationary fears. A major concern here is that the size of the Fed's balance sheet exposes it to direct political pressure that may threaten its independence. Although low probability, any loss of central bank independence is a major blow to the Fed's ability to achieve its long-run goals of stability and inflation and output. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to uh, spend my five minutes fixing the problem. The, uh, <laughs> here's the problem. The problem is not so much the specifics of what we're trying to do to rescue the banks. I think the problem is with the fundamental structure of the financial system, we've set up the system in a way that uh, that it's very fragile. We want to rebuild the system in a way that it's secure, that we will never see these kinds of problems happen again. We have a variety of interconnected problems of malfeasance here, 
where people are able to cheat and lie and just just uh, basically uh, engage in behavior, moral hazard behavior that will leave liabilities for other people to handle, including taxpayers. And you know about the whole collection of these, you've been reading about them, whether it's uh, rating companies being in effect bribed to give good ratings, whether it's uh, companies uh, assuming that their deposits will be covered by the FDIC and taking extra risks, whether it's um, uh, any variety of, of uh, problems with the directors not overseeing, you know, how, how AIG is managing its its assets uh, because they're being bribed by the CEO, who's, uh, and then in turn they are bribing the CEO by giving them high bonuses in, in exchange for short-term revenue results. So we have this collection of problems that we need to address to get capitalism back on its feet. So how would I fix this? Well, here's what I would do. I would take the financial system, all the financial corporations, including insurance companies, and have them operate as pass-through mutual funds. This proposal, by the way, is called limited purpose banking. And the idea is that you limit uh, banks, and banks here is a short ho short, sh uh, shorthand for all financial companies. You limit banks to their legitimate purpose, which is just to intermediate between people that want to lend and people that want to borrow and people that want to save and people that want to invest. So banks need to be understood to be financial intermediaries. That's their purpose in life. Their purpose in life is not to gamble with our money. Okay. So here's how you get the banks not to gamble with your money. You don't, with our money, you do not let them do it. And the way that works is you say, Banks, you have to operate solely as mutual funds. Now, one mutual fund we're familiar with is Fidelity Investments, right? So think about all banks becoming Fidelity Investments. And uh, Fidelity Investments has lots of different mutual funds they're selling. And in selling their mutual funds, what they're doing is intermediating partly between borrowers and lenders. If somebody wants to borrow, they sell a security, a loan to Fidelity, uh, and Fidelity puts it in their mutual fund and gets the money to buy that loan from the public. The public, you know, you and I, we buy their mutual funds, and the mutual funds are then spent on loans of all different kinds, commercial loans, private loans, real estate loans, and they're also being spent, our money, our contributions to Fidelity's mutual funds are being spent on equities. So Fidelity is intermediating, but Fidelity itself is not taking its company's money and putting it at risk. So there's no real risk of Fidelity going under. So if you look at the financial world today, the mutual fund comp companies are the ones that are in good shape. And we should learn from that, that that's the solution to our problem. So under what I'm proposing, all banks and insurance, all financial companies are mutual funds. And they themselves don't hold any risky assets. So a, uh, a Bank of America would not be itself as a company investing in risky assets. It would be allowing individuals to invest in risky assets through their mutual funds, but Bank of America itself would never be able to go under. Bank of America would set up cash mutual funds as one of the many mutual funds it would sell, and the cash mutual funds would be held 100% in cash. So anybody who wants to have a checking account would just put money into a cash mutual fund that would be 100% reserved, and so there could never be a run on the banks for against the deposits. We wouldn't have to have, to have FDIC insurance protection because there'd be 100% reserves against the checking accounts. All the other mutual funds would mark be marked to market, and they would float so that and so that they would break the buck or exceed the buck depending on what the market says they're worth. Insurance companies would set up mutual funds that would uh, in work like this. 55-year-olds uh, who want to buy life insurance would put money into a mutual fund, and the ones who died, their, their survivors would be able to get the money out at the end of, let's say, three months, depending on who. So all insurance products can be set up as mutual funds where the people that get money out get money out, not just based on what they put in, but also on what happens to them. So 
this is a very simple idea. It's called limited purpose banking. It is described in detail on my website. It will keep an AIG from happening again. An AIG would never have anything at risk. Individuals, if the guy who runs AIG wants to go and take his own personal money and leverage it up, he can do that through mutual funds, but he wouldn't put the country's well-being and economic uh, you know, activities at risk. Thanks. I, I, uh, I don't have a solution, uh, but, um, but what I will do is focus today on one aspect uh, from, a, from a regulatory standpoint um, on, on what went on, what led up to the current crisis, and also provide some considerations uh, perhaps for future regulation. Um, financial intermediaries, as I think most of you know, namely traditionally banks, broker dealers, investment advisors, insurance companies, uh, bridge a funding gap between dispersed capital providers on the one hand and capital consumers on the other, in theory, promoting the allocation of capital at lower cost than if, inv than if investors tried to do so themselves directly. Uh, in addition, however, these intermediaries, again, in theory, help to manage risk. For example, an insurance company, uh, through the pooling and management of risk across policyholders, is better able to manage that risk than the insured, certainly at lower cost. Intermediation, however, itself involves risk. And how to manage that risk has been at the heart of the recent debate over whether our regulations are sufficient to meet the challenges of an ever-changing financial market. That risk is principally twofold. The risk that an intermediary will take advantage of its customers, which appears to have been the case uh, uh, in, in some instances during the recent crisis, and the risk that the intermediary will make bad investments, resulting in a decline in credit quality, which I think is underlying this limited pur purpose concept, uh, and potentially systemic instability uh, that puts at risk those who have entrusted capital with it. Historically, this latter risk uh, relating to bad investments has been managed in one or, one or more of four different ways. Uh, first, the intermediary's own efforts simply at managing risk. Second, uh, market-based oversight with investors withdrawing capital uh, or refusing to do business if the intermediary is too risky. Third, portfolio regulation that limits the riskiness of investment assets by regulation with close supervisory oversight. And fourth, backup funding, meaning insurance like FDIC guarantees that lower the risk of depositor runs. Implicit, however, within our financial regulatory structure to date has been an outdated model of the financial markets divided into banks, broker dealers, insurance companies, and investment advisors. We've regulated each entity s differently because they fell within a different preset category based on relatively static ideas about how each of them do business. In many cases, tied to common business practices that existed in the 1930s when many of the laws were first introduced. Uh, as Jamie Dimon, who's the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan, has observed, a lot of the rules and regulations we have are closer to the Civil War than they are to today. Those business distinctions have blurred beginning in the 1970s and the 1980s, fracturing many of the traditional business models. To give one quick example, Today, money market funds and finance companies together replicate a financing function that was traditionally provided by commercial banks at least through the late 1980s. Mar money market funds provide bank-like services to their customers and use the invested capital to fund loans by finance companies that can net that, and these loans can also be obtained from banks. Yet while the functions are substantially the same, banks on the one hand and money market funds and finance companies on the other are subject to completely different regulators and different regulations. AIG Financial Products provides an interesting study of the disconnect between regulation and the current markets. There we had an unregulated entity that sold credit default swaps, a kind of insurance product uh, to protect investors against the drop in the credit quality and value of their investments, to regulated financial entities like banks and broker dealers. First, market efforts by AIG Financial Products counterparties to control the riskiness of that entity failed in part because they did not take account of the pervasive use of similar systems by others in assessing risk, uh, something that economists refer to as a negative externality, or the actions of others if the market declined, yet another negative externality. In both cases, we saw cascading drops in the price of instruments held and sold by uh, financial products and increased calls for collateral, cycling into further declines and a downward sp uh, spiral in price. Second, for regulated entities like banks, uh, these entities outsource part of their traditional risk management function through credit default swaps to unregulated entities like hedge funds who are not subject to the same close supervision. Current proposals at regulatory reform appear so far to not address these problems or at least to not address them completely. 
For example, proposals for systemic risk regulation are based on entities that are too big or too interconnected to fail without fully taking account of the widespread use of similar risk systems that have increased systemic risk without being tied to any one particular entity. A key focus going forward should be on regulating externalities that market-only approaches cannot address on their own. Our focus on hedge funds to date, um, or going forward, needs to take into account their increasing tie to banks and other intermediaries beyond simply their impact on the capital markets. A greater focus on functional regulation, here looking at hedge funds that trade credit derivatives as really an extension of the traditional regulated markets, may also be necessary. As White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel's noted, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. This crisis provides the opportunity for us to do things that you could not do before. What this all suggests to me is that the time is ripe, perhaps after the crisis is better in <coughs> hand, for more fundamental rethinking of how to regulate the current markets. Thank you. Five minutes. So my role on this panel is to remind everyone that we've been here before, or at least Chuck Whitehead and I have been. <laughs> Uh, I'm talking about Japan's long economic stagnation in the aftermath of the bursting of its large-scale stock and real estate bubble. Much has been made of the Japanese example lately in U.S. policy circles and in the media, with commentary ranging across fiscal policy, monetary policy, and financial regulation and supervision. But the lessons of Japan are contested. In the next few minutes, I will try to provide an economic and political overview, and it is going to be a very brief overview, of some of the key issues. First. The Japanese example is often invoked in trying to answer the question of whether fiscal policy can make a difference in the face of a major financial crisis. It has become a widespread talking point among conservative com commentators in the United States, as well as European leaders, to say that Japan carried out unprecedented fiscal stimulus and that that stimulus had no effect. Neither is exactly true. Fiscal stimulus began slowly and proceeded in fits and starts. When fiscal stimulus was really exerted, it contributed positively to propping up total demand in the economy. When it was withdrawn suddenly in 1997 due to fears about expanding public debt, the result was disastrous in terms of both short-term growth and the solvency of the banking system. Nonetheless, fiscal policy alone was not sufficient to bring back what the Japanese government likes to call autonomous private sector-led growth. Second. It's widely agreed that Japan fell into a severe liquidity trap due to Bank of Japan reticence first about reducing interest rates to historically low levels and then about quantitative easing measures or what we're now calling non-traditional monetary policy tools. Like European leaders today, BOJ economists res resisted aggressive measures to push liquidity into the economy, arguing that the increase in base money could lead to a major spike in inflation or even a new asset bubble once economic uh, growth picked up again. They were wrong, as seen in the fact that Japan has been more plagued by deflation than by inflation, even in the years of most rapid economic growth since the economy bom bottomed out around 2002. Fortunately, Fed Chairman Bernanke, as well as the New York Fed research staff, are on record as clearly recognizing that the risks of deflation are much wor worse than the risk of inflation uh, in the midst of a crisis. Third. Financial, uh, Japanese financial supervisors operating in a context of antiquated regulation chose informal means by which to conceal or suppress the losses of Japanese financial institutions. The net effect was that banks were encouraged to continue lending to their worst borrowers and not to quickly write down or seek to, uh, or seek to sell non-performing loans. When the government did put in place non-compulsory opportunities, to sell non-performing loans, banks chose to wait for economic recovery or government bailout rather than to sell at a loss. Meanwhile, the requirement that the government's resolution and collection corporation not lose money meant that it did more warehousing of bad assets than resolution of bad assets. This put downward pressure on non-performing loan prices, reducing the incentive for solvent banks to use the RCC to clean up their balance sheets, while also preventing the RCC from jump-starting a distressed assets market by initially selling at a loss. I'll leave you to think about whether there are parallels. Only the threat of government takeover was sufficient to concentrate the minds of bank management. There is, of course, much more to say about all these policies, but let me finish by pointing out that in all these areas, politics was key. One reason that the BOJ was so resistant to aggressive monetary policy 
was doing, due to its ongoing political battles with the Ministry of Finance to gain and then to assert its institutional autonomy. In uh, financial supervision, regulators and politicians, rightly as it turned out, feared public outrage over any use of public funds to address the problems of banks, helping to draw the problem out for years. Finally, Japanese financial institutions effectively lobbied their regulators not to rewrite rules in such a way that would further weaken them in the short term, even though such uh, stricter prudential regulation was needed to restore the health of the system as a whole. Uh, I will leave it to you and to uh, my friend Graham Wilson to decide whether there are parallels in U.S. politics today. <coughs> Thank you. I've uh, entitled my remarks, The Politics of Confusion, and I want to talk about it in relation to three aspects, policy definition, attitudes, and finally, what might be the antidote to confusion leadership. First, policy definition. I think we have to recognize that we are coming to the end of a long period in which there were fairly stable attitudes, I would argue, on an international basis, uh, which have been challenged by the current crisis. That some of you may have seen the act of con contrition by Alan Greenspan, where he called into question views which he had uh, expressed and argued for so strongly that markets are efficient and effective and that, by implication, regulation should be minimized. That was a, a viewpoint that was by no means limited to this country or to the conservative part of the political spectrum. Uh, similarly, in terms of the capacity to, of governments to manage economies and to avoid recessions, we have come to the end of a period where, again, people doubted the capacity of government. It's interesting, if you take the quotation, we used to think that you could spend your way out of a recession and increase employment by cutting taxes and boosting government spending. I tell you in all candor that option no longer exists, and that's far, so far as it ever did exist, it only worked on each occasion by injecting a bigger dose of inflation into the economy, followed by a higher level of unemployment as the next step. Does anybody know who said that? Uh, answer. Jim Callaghan, a British Labour Prime Minister, in a very courageous speech to the Labour Party conference in 1976, and what that marked was a long period in which internationally we doubted the capacity of governments to counteract unemployment. Well, watch what they're doing now. You can see that those attitudes have been thrown out of the window. Uh, moving on to talking about attitudes in the mass public, there is, I think, tremendous out there in, anger out there internationally. If you look at the opinion polls on whether business executives are unethical people, you will find tremendous consensus uh, among the advanced democracies on this question. 67% of the British think that business executives act unethically. 76% of the French, 81% of the Germans, and 76% of the Americans. So there is this anger and frustration with business leaders out there. Uh, but on the other hand, the public is also, I, particularly in this country, worried about, concerned about the implications of policies based on large-scale public lending. Indeed, if given the choice, would you worry about containing the government debt or would you push for an economic stimulus? The American public is very evenly divided uh, about which would, should be the priority. So I think that there is here uh, quite a capacity for the public to move in a number of sharply different directions. Anger with the business system that we might normally associate with the left in politics, but also fear of concern about uh, the government going deeply into debt and that money being used to prop up the, if you like, capitalist pigs as the public has been seeing them in, in recent times uh, around the globe. So I think one of the interesting questions here is whether or not there is a capacity in this crisis, not for left-wing politics, but for a right-wing populism. And I think that if you're a Republican Party strategist or a Conservative Party strategist, one of the options that you might be thinking about right now is whether that public anger, but yet concern about public, uh, public debt and growing government debt might provide the right as well as the left with an opportunity. Now, in times of con confusion, leadership is obviously crucial, and President Obama looks to be in an extremely strong position. 
His overall approval ratings are 61% thinking he's doing a good job, 37% uh, having doubts about his performance. But it's worth noting that his approval rating uh, or disapproval rating is the most partisan based on record. In other words, uh, the division between Republicans and Democrats on how you eva evaluate the president is extremely large. Although President Obama's overall approval ratings are very high, they are much more uh, questionable on economic policy, where his favorable rating uh, to unfavorable rating, rating ratio is 48 to 41 percent. So even President Obama looks weaker uh, in terms of public standing on the economy than in uh, policy evaluation overall. But the point that I'd want to stress is that when you look around the advanced democracies, President Obama is in a very unusual situation in being in a strong situation. Most democratic leaders are in political trouble. Uh, President Sarkozy in France last year uh, plumbed new record lows for a French president in approval ratings. Uh, Gordon Brown, who was given, I think, a very nice boost by President Obama from his point of view, uh, has uh, lagged behind the Conservative Party uh, for a long period now and is uh, in double-digit di double percentage points behind in the opinion polls to the Conservative Party. And as to the Japanese Prime Minister and his standing, well, Bill can probably tell you uh, very effectively what that is. So President Obama is in a strong position overall, already showing a little less strong position in economic affairs, but the situation of confusion that I've uh, very briefly outlined is one that is confronted in most countries by political leaders who are already in political trouble. So thank you very much. That is your intellectual stimulus package. Um, and I dare say it should work. Uh, before we continue, we're going to open it up for discussion. But I want to make sure that we acknowledge <coughs> Roger Fusa, who puts together the Discovery Series, each of them. It takes a lot of work getting people together and so forth. So I'd like to acknowledge that. We will take about 20 minutes just for discussion. There are two microphones, Roger on this side, Karen on that side. Um, and uh, let the discussion begin, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to address this question to the panel. Uh, Mr. Whitehead, specifically you mentioned uh, during your presentation um, the uh, president, I believe, of uh, J.P. Morgan, um, Jamie Diamond. Um, he was presented in something that I heard earlier today on NPR as saying that his bank would not be participating in the public-private bailout that's been proposed by the government. Um, his balance sheet looks better, and I guess that's true for some of the other major banks. My question is, um, does that put a crack in the arm, or a further crack perhaps, uh, that um, may be being proposed as a solution uh, for all of these quote-unquote toxic assets. Uh, the concern being that the other major banks who have improving balance sheets will buy off as well and will not participate. Um, does this program have a chance of working or of helping, uh, given what Mr. Diamond said today? I guess I'm close enough. Uh, no, it's, it's more of an economics issue than a regulatory one, but let me try to address it. I actually think there's a Japan angle to the answer. And so, and, and what I mean by that is, so, so the concern you've got when you have someone break away from the group, like Jamie Dimon, and he's saying it because although J.P. Morgan was, I guess they had their earnings just come out, they were 10% down relative to last year, but they're actually, they exceeded market expectations. And so he's saying, look, we're doing fairly well, stock price is up, we think we have a sound balance sheet. The concern you have uh, is that, uh, by and large, these sorts of these sorts of bailout policies, procedures, tend to be uh, sort of convoy-like. Not so much in that um, everyone uh, feels they have to go in, but if you end up going in and others don't, it's really an indication, a signal to the market that your balance sheet is weaker. Uh, 
Uh, and so the Japan response to this actually, uh, when they went through a series of bailouts, was to actually mandate everyone, irrespective of whether or not they needed the money or not, to actually jump in. Kind of what you hear, you're hearing stories that this actually happened with the original, the original bailout scheme, uh, that um, folks were told they had to sign up for it, irrespective of need. And so the question will be whether or not you're going to see a second round of, the, uh, of that sort of pressure. Um, uh, in line with what we saw in Japan. This, this concern being, again, that not so much with the stronger balance sheets, but the less strong balance sheets will feel market pressure if they choose to opt in uh, where others haven't. So that would be the concern for me uh, in light of what, what it sounds like Jamie is now saying. Um, a couple of weeks ago on 60 Minutes, Ben Bernanke said one of the sources of this problem was that there was simply too much investment capital. Investment capital pouring in from Asia, pouring in from the baby boomers who have stopped spending and are now saving. My question is, with the incredible manufacturing capacity of the world now, who's going to buy all this stuff? And I might add the decline in real wages in the United States, who was buying all this stuff? Uh, you go ahead, Larry. Oh, okay. Let me take a crack at that. Um, I don't think that was the problem. I don't think that the world has too high a national, uh, too high a saving rate, and there's too much investment in the world. I think that's not a problem. I think the problem is with the different, you know, the fact that you could issue liar mortgages and sell them to, you know, sell them to people, and that AIG could could sell insurance, uh, all you know, 1.6 trillion dollars worth of CDS policies without anybody checking and uh, pretending that it could actually come through with uh, in an event uh, like we're experiencing when it clearly couldn't. So we're not going to fix this problem of trust until we have a system we can trust. It's not an issue of whether Jamie Dimon does or doesn't use his bank to take this particular policy. That policy isn't getting at the core problem, which is trust. And so you need to have a new system which is going to get to trust. And that's a system where none of the financial companies are ever too big to fail because they're never holding anything that's risky. And where you have the government setting up the equivalent of an FDA, which I call the Federal Financial Authority, to rate all securities. So you don't have to worry about S&P being bribed to give bad ratings or, or inappropriate ratings. So that's what I'm trying to get you folks all to think about, a radical reform that's actually <coughs> going to solve the problem. The problem is not insufficient demand. The, the problem is the country is psyched out because it doesn't see a real solution to the core problems of cheating and lying uh, and uh, taking advantage. Well, I, I just want to, I think, clarify something. Uh, he, uh, Bernanke is right. There is, there is not a li liquidity problem in the world. There's plenty of liquidity. Um, you know, there's some $12 trillion sitting in central banks and in sovereign wealth funds and in national oil companies um, that has been invested in treasury bills and two-year treasury bonds. So it, 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 there's, there's not a problem with liquidity. Um, also, liquidity is not the problem. Um, when he says that, it, what bothers me about that statement is, gee, there was too much money sloshing around. It's like the, the, uh, the drunk who gets arrested and says, he's the victim. He was overserved at an open bar. Um, it, the, there was liquidity and plenty of it. How was it used and how was it deployed? And when there's so much liquidity, returns are low, so you had investment managers trying to get that extra 16th or extra 8th return, but they also didn't want any risk. So what did they do? They, they, they invested in what was perceived to be absolutely no risk, mortgage-backed securities linked to U.S. residential mortgages, the best investment ever over time. And it turns out that the people that produce those securities change the nature of those securities significantly. And so suddenly, a, a number of people who thought they were getting 
a, a security backed by the good old 30-year conventional mortgage uh, of a U.S. property was suddenly getting securities backed by floating rate notes in slum areas written, written by fraudulent mortgage brokers. Um, because of that, to me, my storyline is the, the, not only was the size of that problem large, about $3 trillion in non-conventional mortgage-backed securities, um, the size alone is a shock, but for a number of institutional investors with all this liquidity, they were stunned that the most secure investment you could make other than a U.S. Treasury bond went to hell and it became a terrible asset. And the next story I'll say is quickly, the, the, those that were shocked were people in Norwegian municipality pension boards, were in nice. Icelandic banks, were in German uh, uh, sa savings banks, and so the contagion of this, this problem of taking advantage of liquidity by feeding it uh, basically poisonous investments occurred globally, which, which, and so the feedback was a global shock in a total just collapse of investment and demand. Bill Grimes, Simon Gilchrist, and then we'll move on. Um, I, I actually uh, want to agree with a lot of what uh, Bob Bench has said, but, uh, but still uh, take Bernanke's side on this one. As far as I know, and I'm happy to be corrected by my macroeconomist friends down the, down the table, uh, there has never been uh, a major asset bubble without uh, excessive growth of liquidity. Uh, what fuel, what, whatever is causing people to change their judgment or to believe that they can manage risk, which uh, you often see financial innovation of some sort going along with it, in the end these things are monetary phenomena. Um, an, Lots of money comes in. It's going to feed into something. Uh, people are either going to be, uh, prices are going to go up somewhere because the, uh, the stock of stuff uh, is not growing as quickly as the stock of money. Uh, in many cases, uh, you get price inflation. Uh, in cases in which price inflation is held down for whatever reason, this was going on in Japan uh, as well, or where uh, financial innovation seems to offer very good returns, you get, pri you get asset price inflation. Um, and the, uh, as I said, I agree with all these, uh, the, the points that have been made about uh, the, the adverse incentives. Uh, and if it weren't for the incentives or the bad regulation or the uh, excessive optimism uh, or the desire to, to, chase, uh, to chase return, um, this wouldn't have happened exactly as it did. Uh, but in the end, uh, excess liquidity in the, in the global economy uh, washed ashore in the United States and elsewhere, uh, and it created bubbles in a lot of places, uh, not just in the United States. We see a severe uh, real estate bubble that, and, uh, and stock bubble that was going on in, in China. Uh, we see it elsewhere as well. Japan was immune the second time around, uh, but, uh, but quite, uh, quite a victim the first time around. So uh, the, uh, the policy implications for the United States government are, I think, exactly what, uh, what my colleagues are talking about in terms of thinking about the, uh, uh, the incentive structure. Uh, but uh, in terms of the, the, the global wash of liquidity, I think we can't deny it. I think, um, let me make two comments. First, I think the right way to think about the role of liquidity is that it starts the speculative bu bubble going. So housing prices start to rise. I'm worried that if I don't get in now, I'm not going to get in later. I buy my house. You know, everybody thinks that there's, you know, the greater fool behind them so that they can get out. So I think that's the role of, of loose money. It's also useful to think about Japan versus the United States in terms of asset bubbles. The United States had a phenomenal bubble in the stock market. It had a virtually no impact when it collapsed on the U.S. economy. We had a very mild, almost non-existent recession. The difference between Japan and the United States is that in Japan, banks held stocks. Therefore, as the stock prices rose, the bank's balance sheets also expanded. Land in the United States plays a major role in terms of bank assets. So this bubble in terms of assets fed straight into the banking system, allowed the banking sector to expand and to take risks. And I also want to say that I think it really is extreme risk-taking by the financial sector that caused this. I think that banks in 
Nor Norway knew what they were doing. They were looking for AAA-rated securities to satisfy regulatory requirements, but they didn't want to pay for AAA in terms of getting low yields. So they bought into these securities where everybody knew that the ratings weren't really what they meant. Okay. If you look at the investment banks in the United States, leverage ratios of 30 to 1, that's extreme risk taking. So it's really that that compounded the problem. Can I actually, can I jump in one, I'll just, <coughs> sure. just to round it out. Um, so I'm going to try, actually, I, I actually, I guess, I guess really two points to sort of follow up. I, I think you're, you're hearing this and underscoring some of the discussion from, from my colleagues here as well. The, the nature of the investor base changed. Uh, the, the, the original bubble, if you will, for, for uh, mortgage-backed uh, securities, although there's always been a real estate market, was actually the commercial whole loan market in the 1990s. Uh, you saw a rapid expansion uh, beginning in the early 90s through about the late 1990s. Nomura Securities, large Japanese investment bank, dominated the markets here in the United States. Um, the difference in the investors were that the investors in that market were dirt investors. These were people that actually understood the real underlying value of the properties they were investing in. Uh, and so when that bubble actually imploded, there was a, there was a problem with these commercial whole loan securities in the late 90s. Uh, Nomura was wiped out, but a lot of the dirt investors were largely, they, they took hits, but they knew what they were investing in. That's a very different world than what you're hearing about in the context of Norwegian banks. Uh, who were very much looking for higher yield. If you looked at the market for mortgage securities uh, that were rated AAA, they traded at a discount to AAAs by, let's say, an IBM or, or an industrial company, reflecting the fact that there was a structure here and that there were inherent risks that were not tied to traditional industrial bonds. Uh, and so you had a different type of an investor base, one perhaps with more money to spend, less sophistication in, in, in the dirt area, understanding the nature of what they were investing in, uh, and looking for this higher yield. So. Uh, there's probably a relationship between this liquidity concern you're hearing on the one hand and the nature of the investors on the other. Uh, and you saw that shift between the commercial whole loan market where you had a sophisticated base in the 90s versus what you've seen more recently. Uh, this question has to do with the future. And it has to do with, I mean, it brings up the whole question of the bonuses that the talent Remember, they were worried about the talent leaving, so they kept paying the bonuses. Um, uh, and then finally, I read one article where the talent was described as salespeople. I mean, they didn't want to lose their top salespeople, who, of course, were the ones that were selling uh, the securities that caused this problem. How can we, I mean, how can it be, be prevented that uh, the same uh, type of <coughs> uh, employees uh, that they'll be hiring um, won't happen in the future. I think, can, do you understand what I'm talking about? I'll, I'll take the first shot at yeah. that. Um, no matter how I look at this problem, well, whenever I look at this problem, you, you say, what, why did this happen? And, and you go through an analysis and you always come out saying it was a compensation system. I mean, you, what we're talking about is behavior. And when you try to figure out the incentives and why do they do these things, uh, why do they create these special investment vehicles? Why do they park them in Grand Cayman? Why, why do they park them offshore or off balance sheet? Um, you, you always come back to say, well, it must have been the compensation system. And of course, uh, there is a growing chorus of analysts that are saying the, comp the compensation system skewed so much behavior that you ended up with the skewed financial system. Uh, in terms of going forward, uh, there is clear building consensus that compensation systems in financial trading rooms and financial institutions, and even at the highest level, will uh, uh, still include incentives. But those incentives will be much less cash and much more equity in the firm that you're working for. Number two, they will not be available this year or in three months. 
but they'll be deferred. In other words, you can't access those bonuses until your actual performance is seen over time. Um, and at the highest level, the institutions are moving towards modest uh, salaries, large bonuses in terms of the institution stock, but you don't get to get that stock until you actually retire, therefore locking in the executives for a long time. So there does seem to be a building consensus towards sanity uh, in terms of the compensation schemes in the financial sector. In addition, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see a regulation or two that allows the financial regulators to take a view on compensation schemes in large financial institutions. So I think what we got going on here is that the folks who got us into this mess are doing their best to steer the solution and they want to make it kind of come back to be the same system they had that we had to begin with and you know the idea of compensating um, uh, management with stock you know for big corporations the, the problem is that the corporate managers the CEOs are appointing the directors they're giving them high salaries to be directors and then the directors are kicking back money to the CEOs in terms of huge compensation so uh, the you know if, if the shareholders are too dispersed we have a problem with corporate governance uh, here so so let's try and make it much simpler let's make sure that that uh, financial companies can't gamble with the taxpayers money and they can't even they can't gamble period uh, and that all they can do is hire these financial wizards to be to run these money, uh, these mutual funds, and those mutual funds are going to be buying securities, which the government, the f this federal financial authority, would be rating. So everybody would know what, on the internet, they'd be able to see exactly what Joe Blow is has purchased every day in this mutual fund, and then they would see whether his mortgage mutual fund has done better than Sally's mutual fund that she's running, and then Joe would get compensated based on fees. So there are ways we can fix this problem, but it's not going to be coming out of Wall Street. Wall Street wants to maintain uh, its hold over the economy. And if you really think about it, we don't need to fix toxic assets. Those toxic assets are there. Whatever is toxic is there. Some people have lost, some people have gained. The physical buildings are still with us, right? There's nothing real that's really changed here except a redistribution. <coughs> So the whole government, you know, futzing around of saving the toxic assets, it's really just moving money back from some people who lost to some people who, you know, from people who won to people who lost. That's really what's going on. The only way it's really going to fix this economy is not redistributing back and forth, but rather making sure people are confident enough to move ahead. And to employ people to think they've got a financial system that they understand and that will work. We don't need this decayed financial system at the margin to move ahead. All we need to do is get mutual funds and get them operating, and they do operate, and we can use them as a banking system just fine. Let's do one more question and then our lightning round in reverse order, and then we'll get together out there. I, b I would like to know your opinion about the fact that it seems, and by the way, I've been a great supporter of, of the new presidency, but it seems kind of peculiar to a lot of Americans, I think, and foreigners, that the same very people that were in charge or in positions of great authority during the development of this crisis are the same people who are now called to be the experts in order to solve the problem now, including a lot of regulators who for 10 years, 15 years, I have seen very few people warn of the fact that these derivatives have reached a global level of $350 trillion. In America alone, it's bigger than the gross national product. Yet, all of a sudden, we resort to the same names as before. I saw an article in The Globe only about a week ago that a black lady, PhD in mathematics, who was warning Summers 
that there was a problem with the whole derivatives hedge in the Harvard Trust, yet she got fired out of the job. So I think that we can discuss the blowing of the next biggest bubble, mother of all bubbles, because this is what is happening. But I think until there is a responsibility of people individually to oppose their CEOs, not to just toe the line in the corporate structure and kiss the ass above and kick the ass below, that whatever rescue is going to be attempted is going to be distrusted by the American people. And that's why, in spite of very, very low interest rates on your treasuries, people are still putting their money in treasuries. Nobody is investing anything. And I think it's because of the lack of trust. So until people can object and can publish a free opinion against their superior without thinking they're going to be now losing the opportunities for the rest of their life, the super corporate structure of America is about, and Europe and the rest of the world is what is under pressure. Of course, being at BU today, after a long period of, call it dictatorship, of Mr. Silber, where nobody had the courage ever to say anything because it would have had grave repercussions on their careers. Obviously, it's, it's a difficult position. But what I mean is that the American people are showing a lot more insight than the so-called experts. And that is why there is a reason of mistrust, because we have the same people in charge. And I think that Mr. Volcker should replace the, the rest of the leadership, because at least the American people have some trust in him. How, how do you feel about that? Uh, <laughs> well, I, here, I, here I, we see the 80% of people who are uh, unhappy with business executives have voiced uh, their opinions <laughs> voiced very effectively. I think that one of the things we've been talking about tonight is that we have, uh, we've had a very innovative financial industry, and in a way it should be, but the problem was on the regulatory side that we had people who were placed in charge who did not really believe in regulation, certainly not in regulatory innovation. If you take the head of the SEC, he was appointed because in Congress he had a consistent voting record of opposing regulation, wanting to cut it back, not introduce new regulation. If you put somebody like Cox in charge of the SEC, what message are you sending to the SEC staff about the value of coming up with innovative new regulations? The other thing, and this le leads me to uh, be very interested in what Larry's been talking about, like a new financial authority, is that I think in this country we've had an extraordinary chaos of regulatory organizations on the financial side. I can never count enough. The FDIC, the controller of the currency, the Fed, the SEC, and so on and so forth, plus the states. And we've had this industry where boundaries in the financial sector, boundaries have been broken, breaking down. We've had this plethora of regulatory authorities. I'm told if you've got a reasonably competent lawyer, you can write your own description so that you can move from one regulatory body to another according to who will treat you better. No wonder we got into trouble. Can I take a quick crack at some of this? Um, I, I think it's a great set of questions. Uh, I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, we've got this building populism, and you're a good example of that. Uh, people are not stupid. Uh, plenty of people have said, is this Clinton too?" administration? Um, and indeed, a lot of the personalities in this administration and the financial regulatory side were the same personalities in the ending Clinton administration. They're back. Um, in, now, in fairness, I worked in Washington 33 years, and um, 22 of that in government, and when there's a change of administration from one party to the other, it is absolutely a nightmare every time. The outgoing party doesn't leave much to play with. The incoming crew is all on the make. Everybody's on the make. Everybody's got a new position. Everybody wants to get ahead. Everybody wants to be in every issue. And so it's a nightmare generally. This administration came in not only having its administrative nightmare to deal with, they've got a global financial nightmare to deal with. Um, 
And so in those terms, God bless them. I mean, it's, they must be working 200 hours a week because there's only a handful of them doing it. They haven't even got their appointees through the con approved through the Congress. There's no assistant secretaries, under a secretary. It's just what's left over from the last administration plus uh, Tim Geithner and, and a few others. Um, it, it'll settle down, um, but I don't think, I mean, for instance, the number of people feel they haven't used Paul Volcker appropriately, especially globally and abroad. He's God all around the financial world outside the United States. He's a, he's a seasoned spokesman, um, but they really haven't deployed him. Um, Geithner, without his own staff, has to rely on the White House staff and inputs. That involves the White House. That sort of politicizes things more than perhaps they would be if everything was being managed in the Treasury. The other problem you have politically is we have 535 secretaries of the Treasury <laughs> because with all this taxpayer money being spent, every member of Congress believes that they too are in charge. And if you were to go back and just look at the congressional record the last two months, somebody from Treasury is testifying every other day in front of some committee in Congress. So if you think it's hard enough to get any work done without any staff, try to get some work done when you have to testify every 48 hours. So we do have a management crisis within the financial crisis. Um, that bothers a lot of people, bothers the markets, and it gets back to this restoration of trust and confidence because it's hard to have con This is all about do the institutions have the, 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 the financial capacity and the people capacity to get us through. The financial services industry lost the confidence of people in terms of having the financial capacity and people capacity. And so the markets and the people then said, okay, we'll rely on the government to have the people capacity, et cetera. <laughs> and right now, the US government is stretched into coming up with all the people capacity, which is one of the reasons the whole thing is being managed by the G20 as a steering committee which includes the United States, where in the past the United States would lead everybody through a problem. The U.S. cannot lead right now, so it has to go in with a group and there's a steering committee trying to sort out this problem globally as well as in the United States. We'll now finish with our lightning round of one favorite bullet point conclusion from each of these people in a minute or less, and I'll start at the other end, Graham Wilson. Rahm Emanuel's comment about not wasting crises has been mentioned before, and I think that we can highlight a couple of things in conclusion. First, I think that on this point about governmental structure, for the last four decades in this country, we've been adding more and more political appointees to the executive branch, and we've been pushing the permanent government, the permanent bureaucracy, further and further away. In the State Department, there's hardly anybody left on the Secretary of State's floor who is not a personal staffer these days. And when we hear about incapacity in the Treasury, we did that through adding more and more political appointees and pushing the permanent government uh, further and further back. In Germany, this crisis will be used with a safety net to provide people with 60% of the income that they've lost, but in return, those people will be getting extra training. I think one of the questions that we have to ask in the United States is what use will we be making of this crisis? Um, as a representative of the International Relations Department, I guess I should say something about international relations at this point, uh, and the G20 process is obviously a place to start. Um, I think I share some of the, the uh, points that, um, that Graham has said. One of the, there, there are two, I think, reasons to be pessimistic about the G20 process, aside from the fact that you have, uh, it's, a, it's a cumbersome and new international organization. Uh, but one is that there is no clear vision. There is no agreed vision about what a future financial system should look like. 
we can uh, we have groups that uh, say the the European model or the French model who are arguing that you need a fundamental rethink. You have uh, the U.S. position is largely that we can play around the edges, change compensation, reduce uh, the pro-cyclical nature of uh, of capital requirements, and a variety of other things that are sort of working around the edges, uh, pull in some way the uh, the hedge funds and the heavily uh, leveraged institutions uh, into the regulated system, but through indirect regulation in terms of the way that they get their money from banks, et cetera. Uh, so no common vision with uh, no clear uh, opportunity for leadership and, and no means by which to provide that basic public good uh, means that uh, we should not be surprised if the, uh, uh, if the, the outcome in terms of regulation and supervisory principles uh, is unsatisfying at some level. The other thing, and I'm going to say this very briefly, is that we would hope uh, for some level of macroeconomic coordination. Uh, the, it is said that the uh, U.S. Treasury, uh, which it gave up before it went there, but was hoping for the Europeans to be willing to kick in some fiscal stimulus. Uh, the, the history of macroeconomic policy coordination uh, is not encouraging to anybody who thinks it's a good idea. Uh, if you think it's not a good idea, then you should feel encouraged. Uh, but there is no, uh, the, the history of macroeconomic policy coordination, even among small groups, even among the G5, uh, has been, uh, I, I think, disappointing to anybody who took it uh, seriously. One minute. Um, I, I think in summary, these are not your father's, they are not your grandfather's financial markets. And an underlying theme I think you've heard from the questions and the different comments is, is the markets have changed uh, in dramatic ways. Uh, the nature of the intermediaries have changed. The nature of the investors have changed. Within the intermediaries and the investors, compensation structures, behavior have also changed relative to even 10, 15 years ago. Forget 70, 80 years ago when many of these regulations were first adopted. And so we have a regulatory structure that largely does not reflect the tensions, the incentives, the issues, uh, the mechanisms by which uh, the financial markets operate today. Um, the concern you've got, of course, is, is, is not reliving the same problem 5, 10, 15 years from now. And the answer may very well be a change in regulation. It may be a new adoption, a new structure. Um, but at the end of the day, what I think has to happen, irrespective of the ultimate outcome, is a, a realization that the, the way in which we've approached regulation, and you're really not seeing this in even the most aggressive of the proposals. The Geithner proposal is, is quite innovative in many ways, but it's really an extension of the old way of thinking. It's not a reflection of the new financial markets. That if we don't really rethink the way, uh, re reposition the way we think about financial markets and the ways in which the risks and the problems need to be regulated, we, we do very much face the possibility of running into problems uh, yet again uh, 10 to 15 years down the road. Well, I think we have one shot at getting this right, or we could get into really hot water here. The, um, I don't think it's stimulus, fiscal stimulus, buying up toxic assets. I don't think it's any of this because it comes down to what Keynes viewed as animal spirits, which I think is some confidence that things are going to be better in the future. That's You're not going to hire somebody unless you think uh, somebody else is going to hire somebody else uh, to, to buy your product that the, that the guy you're hiring is going to make. Um, so we can get it right. And it, you know, we can lead the financial world with a very simple proposal, which is to keep people from cheating and lying and stealing, and we just make everything transparent. We start out with a proposition that people ultimately bear risk. It's not companies. I mean, we're seeing that we're bearing the risk of this mess, right? We didn't know about it, but we're bearing it. So let's make everything transparent. Let's run everything through mutual funds. Let's have a federal financial authority to disclose everything that every mutual fund is holding. And let's not let a financial, any financial institution ever be at risk, ever be leveraged, ever borrow short to lend long. It's very simple. Let's never let an insurance company try and insure the uninsurable, which is what AIG did, which is what the life insurance companies today are doing when they say, we're going to pay your life insurance policy. Even if there's a plague, we're going to pay off everybody. Well, they can't do it. The life insurance funds in the states couldn't cover that at all. So we have systematic insuring of the uninsurable going on. We have guaranteeing of the unguar you know, things that can't be delivered. So we need to have a very simple financial fix that will get us around these problems and let Americans get back to work. And that can be done. And, and this team in the White House is not going to do it because they're, 
they're getting they're paid being paid too much by the financial industry either in the past or in the future so you're absolutely right it's not the right right group okay um, Larry has a great proposal on his web page so I think you all should read it but lending is inherently risky it involves buying long-term assets and one way you discipline that process is by uh, having short-term investors that's always going to happen there's always going to be that activity in the economy and there's always going to be that risk I don't think government FICO scores are going to solve it maybe they will in the future they're not going to solve the problem for the next six months to one year. Unemployment rate will continue to rise as long as banks can't lend. So we have to do something immediately to deal with to toxic, a toxic assets and fix the banking system. Otherwise, there won't be any businesses to lend to a year from now. Bag of chips, anybody? <laughs> um, I'm going to agree with Larry in terms of um, the, you have one chance. The danger of this whole episode is we have one chance to get it right, and so it's better be very right. Um, it reminds me of the decision that Jackie Parker took Saturday night. He had one chance, and that was to pull that goalie with four minutes left. An extraordinary move in any game, and it, we had a miracle. Um, to a certain extent, we're going to need a bit of a miracle in terms of policy management. And therefore, to get it right, it's, it, it can't happen fast. Uh, there's a whole uh, menu of steps that are being put in place one after the other. First, to restore trust. Second, to try to stabilize markets. Third, try to get the private sector engine in those markets running again. So there will be either government or private sector new flows of credit and investment so you can stimulate growth, so you can stimulate jobs. I mean, that's the basic program. And the program has to be done nationally, but if we do everything right nationally, it still won't work unless a number of people get it right globally. So as part of this step-by-step, step, there'll be reform of the international architecture for financial services, as well as reform of the U.S. architecture. Now, the trick here is everybody, there's a number of people that want revenge. <laughs> there's a number of people that want restructuring tomorrow, regulatory restructuring. And the real name of the game is to restore confidence and trust, restore uh, growth, and yes, deal with some of these other issues a little bit down later in the menu. Thank you. So I'm glad we didn't get through the evening without somebody mentioning Terry or hockey. Absolutely. <laughs> Something at least is going right in the world. So Bob Bench, Simon Gilchrist, Larry Kotlikoff, Chuck Whitehead, Bill Grimes, Graham Wilson, and Boston University alumni and friends, thank you very much. I want to conclude by bringing up Han Han, who's the head of the CAS Alumni Board, to conclude us. Good evening. I hope you enjoy, all of you enjoy tonight's program. So uh, to wrap things up, I'd first like to begin by thanking Dean Sapiro for her continued sponsorship of our Discoveries Learning and Lecture Series and invite you to come back to campus on Thursday, May 14th for our next lecture. Next, I'd like to thank each of our panelists for sharing their time and their wealth of knowledge and insight this evening. And I'd like to pre present a small token of appreciation for all of your efforts for being here. Now, I'd like uh, all of you to join us outside the auditorium for a reception and Again, on behalf of the Arts and Sciences Alumni Association, thank you very much for attending tonight's event.